Now listen, I don't want any more bullshit. bullshit. You know what? Let's not even fuck around with this one because y'all know what it is, right? You know what it is, bullshit free gang. You know, as expected, really, if you gotta be honest about it, the Colts go down to Tennessee and lose 19-10 in a yet another game. Fifth straight loss to Tennessee. Fifth straight loss that they could have and probably should have won. And it's always the same thing. They go down to play Tennessee and they find a way to lose. You know, I know a lot of y'all are angry, but probably a lot of you, just like me at this point, have almost become numb because this loss was just like the Colts team. Predictable, right? You knew what they were going to do. Go down there and come up with ways to lose the game. Whether it's turnovers or it's missed tackles or it's bad, suddenly bad fucking punting. It doesn't really matter. It's predictable. Much like this Colts team. Much like Frank Wright play calling. Look, we're going to dive into it, but I'm not even going to give you the big long lead in. Y'all know where you are, Bullshit Free Gang. The Bullshit Free Colts Podcast. The one place where you know you can always come to hear everything there is to talk about when it comes to our beloved Indianapolis Colts. But here, baby, as always, you're going to get it with no PR, no coach speak, no spin, no political correctness, and most importantly and most indubitably and enduringly, no motherfucking bullshit. I'm your host. Harkon Ajala at your motherfucking service as always. And like I said, I'm not going to waste a lot of time on this because we really just need to get down to the bottom of really not just where this team is right now, because I'm going to tell you where this team is, but I'm also tell you where it's going. So without any further ado, let me welcome you back. Or if it's your first time here, welcome you to what we do at the motherfucking Bullshit Free Coast podcast. I know I've been gone for a few weeks. I'm back, bitches. And you know what time it is now, right? It's time to do what we do. So let's chop it the fuck up. Okay, I'm not going to really waste a lot of time here. Let's just talk about the four horsemen of the apocalypse here, okay? We're going to talk about Matt Ryan. We're going to talk about the offensive line. We're going to talk about Frank Reich. And we're going to talk about Chris Ballard. Whatever other small problems or other shit that might be going wrong, those are the four legs on the table that we have got to address. Because that's the table that this fucked up bullshit ass product that we've been seeing so far in 2022 are firmly resting on. So let's start with Matt Ryan first because there's been a lot of controversy and a lot of arguing back and forth among Colts fans this year about Matt Ryan, and that, I get it, that kind of comes with the territory, right, he's a quarterback, I get it, um, but let's, let's just look at this shit logically, let's use facts, logic, reason, and let's talk about what's really happening with Matt Ryan, all right, I get it, people are saying he's washed, people are saying he's done, people are saying he's too old, let's talk about what the facts really show us about Matt Ryan, okay, the, the simple fact of the matter is this, Matt Ryan is not fucking Tom Brady. That being said, he ain't Carson Wentz, not by a far shot. So I'm not even going to address the whole Wentz is better than Ryan. We should have stuck with Wentz and all that because, well, let me say this. (laughs) I'll address it once by saying this. There's nobody on podcasts or anywhere else last year who was more forgiving, more giving the benefit of the doubt to and more rooting for Carson Wentz. I saw his talent. I saw the potential there. And I actually gave him the benefit of the doubt. I saw the other issues with the team. And I saw the things that weren't his issues. But let me tell you, I went back and I watched all 17 games from last year. Okay? Once I got away from the emotions of it, and I really just looked at it, Carson Wentz, is one of those players, until he's firmly somebody's backup, he's going to continue to ruin franchises and probably get coaches fired because he's just, he's just talented enough to be tantalizing. 
you keep looking at that arm and, and his mobility and his size and saying, man, if this fucking guy would only do these things. But you know that old saying, if a frog had a glass ass, would he still hop? The truth is, Carson Wentz is who he is. He's the same guy he was in Philly. And the Philly fans tried to tell us, hey, I'm here to say, I'm, this is my mea culpa. Y'all were right. He was the same guy in Indy last year that he was in Philly. He's the same guy in Washington this year that he was in Indy last year. He occasionally makes some great down the field throws because he has a big arm, but his decision making is trash. He doesn't see the offense and his progressions well. He doesn't make good decisions, checking down, etc., getting rid of the ball when he should. He's the guy he is. Matt Ryan is a better option, a much better option, and this, and really the stats are showing that and what we're seeing on the field is showing that so far and in terms of win, loss, and tie standings. However, let's look at Matt Ryan honestly and factually. First, some people say, oh, stop making excuses for him and what have you. I'm not making excuses for the dude. I, I'm not emotionally attached to Matt Ryan. He just got here. But I'm only reporting on what I see based on what I know. Now, I'm not a fucking NFL coach so, you know, I can't analyze on that level, but I played football all throughout my life, including in high school. I understand the game and what's supposed to happen, particularly from the quarterback and tight end and wide receiver positions, okay? And I played running back for a while, too. So, here's the deal. Yes, he's had 11, I don't know, 11 fumbles. Yes, he's had, like, seven, nine interceptions, okay? Most of the fumbles came from free rushers and motherfuckers just running in all over him. They are his fault, partially at least, in terms of when he's not being blindsided. He needs to hold on to the ball, take better care of the ball. I'll give him that, okay? So of, of the fumbles he's had, I think he's had 11. Remember, they only lost three of them, first off. But that being set aside, of those 11, about six or seven of them, I say, hey, those are on Matt Ryan. Cool. The interceptions, he's the guy throwing the ball, right? Ultimately, you have to hold him responsible. Some of them have just been terrible decisions, terrible throws. But some of them have been situations where the receiver was not doing what they were supposed to be doing. In particular, for example, the first interception today, the pick six today, that essentially swung the game, right? You take away that pick six, defense held him to four field goals throughout the whole game on the road so take away the pick six it's probably a different game but you can't take it away but here's the truth go back and look at it you say oh that was terrible matt ryan threw it right to the guy he threw it right into two guys what was he looking at well he wasn't really looking that is something that they practiced he was throwing to a spot where paris campbell was supposed to be matt ryan read the blitz paris campbell apparently did not read it Paris Campbell did not break his route off, turn around and sit down like he was supposed to. So instead of being where he was supposed to, which would be catching the ball for a short four or five yard gain or whatever, instead he kept running and the two defenders converged on the pass that was already coming. And there you go, pick six. Now the second interception was all Matt Ryan. That's just one of the things I've seen with his interceptions, most of them this year, most of the time, they're coming from pressure. There's pressure bearing down on him, and here's where he's really making the mistake. He's pressing, trying to make something happen, and you can see him do it. The pressure makes him rush to try to squeeze the ball in where he saw it could go, and those are interceptions. So I'm giving him full credit for those, interceptions and fumbles. That being said, it's been very clear when he has time even a semblance, a modicum of time, just two and a half seconds maybe, he can fucking still deal. And he's done that. He has three, I'm sorry, four game-tying drives in the fourth quarter, three game-winning drives in the fourth quarter. That should have been four, but noodle leg ass hot ride, missed a chip shot field goal in the first game that should have gave us a win against the Texans. So technically, the coach should be four and three right now. But that's neither here nor there. I'm giving him credit for the mistakes. But I'm telling you, if you watch, you can see he can still deal. 
He's mobile enough. He's not fucking Lamar Jackson. He's not fucking uh, Patrick Mahomes. But he's mobile enough to move around, climb the pocket when he needs to, to get himself out of trouble when he needs to. He's still very accurate. Contrary to some of the bullshit I see Colts fans posting on Twitter or whatever, his arm is not a noodle arm. His arm is plenty strong enough. Okay, it ain't a cannon, but he never really did have a cannon arm. But it's plenty strong enough he can make all the throws. You saw that last week. He can make the deep throws when they're open. They're just very rarely open. And if they are, he doesn't have time to get them there. Folks, they're not even calling long passes because they can't protect. So before we move on, that brings us to the next thing. But before I move on to that, I just want to say finally about Matt Ryan. Matt Ryan is good enough for the Colts to win, get into the playoffs, and make some noise there. 100%. The only thing holding him back is the second leg of this table that we got to talk about. The offensive line. Okay, look. Listen. This offensive line has regressed this season at a level and in a way that I don't believe I've ever seen before in all my years of watching NFL football. And let's be clear. Let me tell you what's actually happening. Because some people are, are misreading it. Yes, Matt Pryor is hot trash. Yes. I'm sure he's a nice dude, for real. I'm sure he works hard in the offseason. But the man's offensive line play is like hot garbage with diapers in it. Okay? Yes, that's true. But it ain't just him. What we're seeing all across the line is full stop regression, and it's crazy. You, they got to fire that offensive line coach. I'm not necessarily saying it's his fault, but, I mean, you got to do something. Because here's the thing. First off, last year was a little bit of fool's gold, and so was the year before. But not all of it was fool's gold. Here's the truth. Last year... They couldn't pass block worth a damn last year either, okay? But they were excellent at run blocking. When they blocked for the run, Q, Ryan Kelly was good too, but especially Chris Reed and especially Braden Smith. They're really good. Even the fish that saved Pittsburgh. <laughs> I'm sorry. I just had to make that joke. Some of y'all who remember that old ass movie will get it. Even Eric turnstile fisher was pretty good at run blocking and so was matt Pryor in the small sample size we saw when he came in for fisher but part of the biggest difference you're seeing this year is they are fucking trash at run blocking this year too so you talk about matt ryan understand guys matt ryan was brought here to do one thing which is to hand the ball off with a strong-ass running game and make the pass plays that you need him to make when you need to pass. Be accurate, don't make mistakes, get the ball where it needs to, go through your progressions, et cetera, et cetera. And yes, absolutely 1,000%. After a befuddled-ass, low-energy, uh, duh, dolt-ass acting Carson Wentz, Matt Ryan was brought here to provide leadership and he's done that no doubt about it but he wasn't brought here for a line that can't pass block or run block and they are trash even at run blocking this year as evidenced by the fact that J JT Jonathan Taylor can't get on track this year he was fucking running rub shot over the whole league last year remember this year he can't get on track so Matt Pryor or the rookies Raymond or, you know, the young guys, Danny Pinter and Will Fries, it can't just be blamed on them. The whole line has regressed. Last year started some of their regression at pass blocking. I'll tell you the one that's been most shocking to me this season has been the regression in play of Big Q. Now, Big Q was great last season, too. He wasn't as great. But this season, I mean, he's full-on struggling. All of them are struggling. And, and you know... A lot's been said about it, but we, we do have to keep it 100 here, right? I mean, maybe these guys heard a little too much of everybody fucking putting them in the Hall of Fame before they've even won a playoff game. You feel me? I mean, all we heard about is, you know, the best line in the league and this O-line is so good and blah, blah, blah. 
We're the highest paid fucking offensive line in the league. It can be argued you should never be paying, right, $45 million or $50 million for your offensive line. But if you are going to fucking do it, they sure as fuck better be the best offensive line in football, right? Your quarterback should be able to go back there, take the snap, jack off, and blow a load off, and then throw the pass. Your running back should be able to pick one of three holes to run through for five to ten yards. If you're going to pay your offensive line like that, you can't have what we're seeing this year. And we're seven games in, guys. We're seven games in. And this is the best configuration they've gotten. And they had to bring in Dennis Kelly to make it as good as it is now. Thank God for Dennis Kelly at left tackle. But why Matt Pryor still starting at right guard, I couldn't fucking tell you. Either way, this offensive line is a huge, huge huge failure and it falls really solely on the shoulders of one person which is the next leg on this table that I'm going to talk about I'm going to skip Frank right for now and let's go to Chris Golden Boy Ballard I've been talking to you guys about this since week two let me just tell you now y'all know I've been a Chris Ballard dude all five of the years before this one but I started to see some criticisms that were definitely warranted last year. His handling of the roster last year, I was like, whoa, whoa, you know what I mean? He's still a fucking draft genius, no doubt about it. He's a savant at drafting. He is a certified genius at acquiring players during the, through the draft. Got a couple more great ones this season in Alec Pierce, Jelani Woods, Nick Cross. But the problem with that is, like what happens with a lot of people who are genius in one area, that genius acts as a smokescreen and it clouds our vision to where we sometimes can't see clearly where they might be not only you're not a genius, but falling really fucking short in other areas. Chris Ballard is a perfect example of this. He's such a fantastic drafter that it's kind of clouded some of our vision. Mine, I will honestly say for sure, at least up until last year, he is not proven to be very good in roster construction, overall roster construction. I believe his philosophy at its core is flawed. And this is a big fucking problem in terms of like how he thinks a team should be built to win a Super Bowl because that's, make no mistake, that's the only thing Jim Mercy is interested in, right? Y'all know that. Winning fucking Lombardi's, baby. You feel me? I guarantee you, if Jim Mercy ever listens to the podcast, that's his favorite part at the end. Winning another fucking Lombardi. That's what he's about. And I'm telling you, when your philosophy is flawed, you got a real problem because the philosophy drives everything. Drives your strategy, drives your actions, drives what you do, who you draft, who you sign or re-sign, right? I believe Ballard's philosophy about how you build a team to win a Super Bowl is fatally flawed. He's all about the trenches, I get it. But brother, if you're going to be about those trenches, you better fucking deliver the players there. You're paying all this money to your offensive line. They're not performing. You brought in all these players on your defensive line. They're performing better, but still not. You know, I don't know. I can't really knock them. They're probably giving you all you can get out of the scheme they're playing. But that's a separate thing. I'm going to talk about that in another podcast. All right. We, get, we need time to talk about Bradley's D scheme because... The defense is balling out within it, but there's some issues there. Anyway, look, Ballard's handling of constructing the roster, I believe, is flawed. I believe we've seen the ceiling of what we can expect from this team based on his philosophy. And I'm telling you, the longer we go into his tenure, the more we see those issues and maybe another one i believe he's like um, like many geniuses he's overconfident in his abilities he's overconfident in his abilities 
which I think makes him rigid and stubborn to a fault. Because he's made some really big blunders that, like, a, you know, a guy off the street could see this is a bad decision. Hey, we've talked about it before. And you saw it. You saw it rear its ugly head again today. Danico Autry wreaking fucking havoc. This is a guy. Ballard found him. Plucked him out of free agency in another great move. And you let him walk to Tennessee for the same contract money because you're haggling over fucking not wanting to pay him quite as much guaranteed money. Huge, huge mistake. Can you imagine Danico Autry on this defensive line? And can you imagine him not on Tennessee? You sure as fuck don't let him go to a division rival of all other things. And remember, they knew Tennessee was the other team vying for him. All Ballard had to do was step up with a little more money. And we still have Danico here. Ego, I believe. Stubbornness. You know, he appeared to have... Uh, admittedly, he appears to have hit the jackpot drafting Alec Pierce in the draft this year. Kudos to him. I love Pierce. I think he's going to be a star. He's already on his way to being one. But look how fucking long it took for Ballard to materially address the wide receiver position in any real serious way. And he still did it through the draft, what he loves best, right? Refused to do it through free agency, even though other teams have done that and won the Super Bowl. Y'all see it all around. You see what happened when um, the Bills made their moves for more wide receivers, right? The Miami Dolphins this year. The Chiefs have done it. You see it. The Bucks did it and rode their way to a Super Bowl win. Ballard just believes he knows better than every fucking body else, even though, and this is the real problem, even though the empirical results don't support that belief. Where are his results that support the belief that his way is better than every fucking body else's? Other teams are going to and winning Super Bowls. He hasn't even won a fucking playoff game in six years. Okay, they won one playoff game. I'm sorry, the year they had Andrew Luck in 2018, right? But not even in one single division title. Come on now. And then most egregious... Most egregious, this year in particular, bro, to roll out the offensive line that's out there, even now, thank God he brought in Dennis Kelly. I give him props for that. But, dude, you know, you could have had Charles Leno last year. You picked Fish instead. Eric Fisher was terrible to the point you wouldn't even re-sign him. He's out of football. This year, you bring in a 37-year-old quarterback who is a pocket quarterback not very mobile and you decide to take a chance on Matt Pryor a career backup journeyman being somehow miraculously good enough over the offseason because he went out and fucking boxed Southpaw Ballard decided yeah I'm going with this guy as the starting left tackle to protect Matt Ryan's blind side you let Glow and Chris Reed walk? I mean, and replace them with unproven guys? And now Matt Pryor's playing over there? Terrible? For me to say it, you know, I don't say it lightly. I believe it's time for a new leader in the GM position. I really do. No, I don't think that Ballard's... I think we've seen the ceiling of his philosophy. I really do. His philosophy along with his stubbornness and ego. It is time to move on. Now, I don't know if we will after this season. But if this season plays out the way I think it will. If next season isn't markedly better, I think next year will be Chris Ballard's last. Now, that may seem shocking to say for you to hear me say. But yeah, I'm ready for somebody new. That brings us to the fourth leg of this table and the final leg. We got to discuss. And of course, you know, that's Frank. We got outplayed. We got outcoached. Just got to get 1% better. Praise the Lord, right. Now, yeah, I'm making a little joke right there because uh, he's a reverend and all that. But I don't give a fuck about his faith. 
If he's a man of faith, wonderful. If he's an atheist, wonderful. If he's a Satan worshiper, wonderful. I don't give a fuck about that. I want a fucking head coach that can positively impact the team. A head coach like Mike Vrabel, who can literally be a reason that the team wins some games that maybe they shouldn't win. And definitely a team wins the games they should win, right? That's what you're looking for in a head coach. That's the head, kind of head coach that can take you to a Super Bowl and win it. We've seen it here before in Tony Dungy, right? You've seen it around the league and other coaches. Look, I don't see it in Frank. I just don't. And it's really for two main reasons, you know? It's in game, but it's also between games. In game, let's keep it a thousand. I've seen what the stuff he's designed. I know for a fact Frank Reich is an unbelievably skilled play designer, okay? Play designer. He's a brilliant play designer. I think he could be a fantastic play caller if, and this is a big if, if he was the offensive coordinator and that's all that his duties were. But as a play caller who's also trying to be the CEO and the overall manager of the team in game as a head coach and then, you know, between the games too, yeah, he's fucking lacking big time. See, I know he has the plays in his arsenal. He's just not able to use them. He's thinking about too much shit. And this is obvious if you watch him game after game, you see some of the same things. You see predictable play calls, some head scratching play calls, but every coach is gonna have that, right? I'm not even so big on some of the head scratchers, that happens, but my issue is that the predictability, constantly predictable in terms of his play calling and his missing out on opportunities, like he's got great plays drawn up. You'd be like, where the fuck are they? The things that have been working and you know probably could work, throwing to the tight ends or screens or whatever. He doesn't do it in game. You've seen him use those plays, but then when the, when the situations come up where they would be perfect to use based on what the defense is doing, he doesn't fucking use them. He doesn't call them. We get the 975th Naeem Hines runs right up the middle. The 674th Jonathan Taylor run right up the middle on first down. The 989th screenplay that's thrown right into the waiting arms of a fucking linebacker that read the play since before they snapped it. The 15,000 single back formation when you got two dynamic backs. Put them back there together. Do some shit the, def the opposing defense isn't expecting, Frank. Make them adjust to you. What the fuck? The players and the coaches are too talented into 2022 NFL for you to think that you can just line up and say, hey, you know what we're going to do. We know what we're going to do. We're just going to beat you doing it. That ain't going to work. You got to have the element of surprise. You have to make catch them off guard. You have to make them adjust to what you're doing. You have to adjust to what they're doing, what you know they're going to do, etc. That's what happened today. The fucking no huddle didn't work as well today. You know why? Because the fucking Titans saw it on tape and they said, oh, okay, they're doing a no huddle. And they prepared for it. And Frank stayed right in it. Exact same formation as what you put on film from last week with the Jaguars. Everything's the same. No one of the fucking offense sputtered today. I mean, what would you expect? They know what's coming. As Dennis Green said in that fucking infamous clip, you let them off the hook. I mean, goddamn, anybody can block a punch if they know where you're going to throw the punch, right? I mean, that, I, I just think that's terminal. I think it's fatal. I don't think it can change. I don't think it can change as long as Frank is the head coach and also trying to call the plays. But there's way more than that. And matter of fact, I think as bad as that is as a head coach, the part that I think is worse about Frank as a head coach, because remember, not everybody's cut out to be a head coach. 
Some people are best as coordinators. Here's the thing. Let's be honest. Frank cannot properly inspire, motivate, threaten, whatever it is. He cannot properly and effectively do the most important job of any leader, which is this. A leader's job is to get the people following him or her to do things that they wouldn't normally do, accomplish things that they wouldn't normally accomplish, perform better than they normally would perform if the leader wasn't there. That's the job. And look, we're five years in and it is painfully obvious. Frank has failed miserably at that job, right? How many, see, this is, I mean, I like Frank. I want him to be a great head coach. But let's keep it a hundred. It's five fucking years. Every single year. The exact same thing. Teams showing up unprepared. Teams giving not giving a hundred percent effort. Teams starting slow. Teams looking flat in the biggest games, the most important games. His teams look bad. His teams look flat. His teams look uninspired. His teams make game-changing mistakes. I mean, if you're a betting person, that's what you should be betting on, that the Colts are going to do those things because it's been constant across five seasons. The only thing more certain than those things is that after all that fucking piss-poor, trash-ass, embarrassing abortion of play happens on the field, the only thing more certain is that Frank's going to walk into the goddamn uh, press conference afterwards and say we got outcoached and outplayed and outclassed and out everything, and we got to just get 1% better. There's plenty of football to be played. We just got to, you know, score more points and stop, and stop the other team from scoring more points and not turn the ball over and be more explosive. And Frank... Like, what fucking planet do you think you're on? You're not on an alien planet explaining football and the objectives of football to aliens. Tell us some shit we don't know. Any one of my children can watch three football games having never seen it before in their life and tell you all those things should happen. What the fuck? And yet it's the same thing over and over and over. More optimism telling us that, hey, I'm, I'm proud of... You know, you're proud that they lost by only 15 when they were down by 47 and shit like that. Constantly looking for the silver lining. Constantly talking and pointing towards, you know, the moral victory or, hey, we did this well or here's what we did good. In a fucking sport that's 1,000% bottom line. You either win or lose. And that's how you make the playoffs. Based on that win-loss record, you either make the playoffs or you don't. When you get in the playoffs, you either win and move forward or you lose and you go home until you get to the Super Bowl. And if you lose by one point in the Super Bowl, you fucking get nothing except the opportunity to walk off the fucking field with the other team's colored confetti falling down over you and them out on the field jumping around celebrating and taking selfies with the Lombardi. This is the ultimate bottom line sport. And this guy does nothing but talk about everything but the bottom line. Does nothing but tell us we should be proud and excited and hopeful and optimistic about everything but the fucking bottom line. Today, oh, you know, we deserve it. We deserve all the negativity. You know what else you deserve, Frank? I wonder, do you, do you acknowledge this for admittedly, by your own mouth, getting out coached for the 47th fucking game out of your five years? Do you agree you deserve to be fucking fired, Frank? Because that's what Frank Reich deserves right now. I don't think it'll happen during this season, but I will tell you, I think... I think it's unqualified truth. I think it's an unqualified truth that unless the Colts somehow get to the playoffs this year and advance a couple of games, like to the AFC Championship, or get in the, you know, get to the second round and maybe lose a heartbreak or something. But I think unless they go 
to the AFC Championship or the Super Bowl or win the Super Bowl, I believe Frank Reich's, you're looking at the end of the Frank Reich era. I believe he's gone after this season no matter what. And I know Chris may stay another year, but Chris ain't going to fight for Frank because he knows he's next if something better don't happen next year. I believe they both probably should be gone after this season. You know why? Because if you're going to pick your, well, I don't know. <laughs> Ballard's such a great drafter, I guess you kind of would like to be there if you're going to pick your quarterback next season, your quarterback of the future. But shit, how good is he on that? I don't know. I don't know. All I can tell you guys is that those four legs of the table combined are not fucking getting it done. And really, because we know, you know, we knew coming in, Matt Ryan was not a permanent solution here, right? So if we're really being honest, all four of those fucking legs of this fucking generic ass, Dollar Tree ass, bargain bin ass, Dollar General, Aldi's ass table that is currently the Colts performance. All four of them need to be gone. We need to move on from all four of them. That's and, I, and I'm just keeping it a thousand there. That's where I'm at. And it's not from emotion. It's from really looking at everything with facts, logic, reason and 100 percent bullshit free. If I'm wrong, let me know in the comments. Y'all let me know. I really want to hear y'all's thoughts on this. But I look at it eight ways from Sunday, and that's what I see. So I guess the only thing I can say here, I just make this plaintive cry to team owner Jim Irsay. Jim Irsay, I know you care about this city. I know you care about the Colts. You love them. I know you care deeply about winning championships. That's what it's all that way it's been about for you. You're still pissed off that we didn't win at least one more while Peyton was here. I know it's all about winning. So all I'm here to say, sir, is put your heart aside. Put your feelings aside. Put how you feel about these people, these coaches, these players. Put that aside and do what needs to be done. And let's go out, if not this year, next year. Let's go out and win another fucking Lombardi, baby. Peace. And win another fucking Lombardi.